how does Spotify recommend music to you? What can your music taste tell us about your personality traits? What is the Napoleon Dynamite effect? All of this and more on today's episode of The Secret Life as Numbers. Welcome to the Secret Life of Numbers podcast, the podcast where we dissect everyday numbers and statistics to find the stories behind them. Each episode, we take a number or statistic and break it down. We will tell you where it comes from and what it means for you. Along the way, hopefully we will inspire you to think about the numbers in your own life. I'm Lavanya, your data scientist on call. I'll be breaking down the numbers. I'm Lindsay, your data translator. For when Lavanya gets too technical on us, I'll be breaking down the rest. (laughs) All right, let's jump in. So, Lindsay, I am extremely excited about this episode because it's the last one in season three. It's our season finale. But also, I feel like we have a data science podcast, and this is the first time I'm actually going to get to define data science. I don't know how we reached this point without (laughs) tossing out that definition. And I don't think it really hit us until we started, like, preparing the outline for this episode of what do we want to talk about? And we were like, oh, we should probably define data science. (laughs) Yeah. So I guess if it's not clear, what we're talking about is how music is recommended to you. I'm going to use Spotify as like a case study, but this is truly a very classic data science problem. And we are also finally going to get a definition for the black box of what is an algorithm. (laughs) (laughs) Because that... (laughs) has plagued us. <laughs> well, me. <laughs> you understand them. <laughs> Let's first begin with the definition of data science, because I, I can't contain myself. <laughs> Hit us with it. I'm so excited. Perhaps one of the reasons why we haven't talked about it yet is because the definition of data science and the field of data science is still growing and evolving, but some core values, and these are coming from IBM. So they say that data science combines the scientific method, math, and statistics, specialized programming, advanced analytics, AI, which means artificial intelligence, and even storytelling to uncover and explain the business insights buried in data. And so when you talk about what a data scientist is, they go further. Data scientists, as data science practitioners are called, require computer science and pure science skills beyond those of a typical data analyst. A data scientist must be able to do the following. Apply mathematics, statistics, and the scientific method. Use a wide range of tools and techniques for evaluating and preparing data. There are different languages that you could code in, for example. The third thing they say is that data scientists extract insights from data using predictive analytics. They also write applications and automate data processing and calculations. Like that's so that all the work that you do can be streamlined and easy. And then... This is like my favorite part about what I do, but we tell and illustrate stories that clearly convey the meaning of the results to decision makers. I think part of your job is data translation. Like we say in the podcast, or well, you're the data translator. I'm the data scientist, but. (laughs) You definitely carry the team on the data front in this, but a big part of your, your job is like, here's the data. What do we do about it? What story does it tell? How do we use this to inform our next step? Data science has kind of been born out of this idea that like data is everywhere. Well, maybe not an idea because data is in fact everywhere and we collect it and we store it. And how do we use it to make decisions or how do we use it in a useful way? Something that you also need to think about it is how do you use it in a fair way and an ethical way as well. Every business and entity has essentially been collecting a lot of data. And then there's that question that's arisen after so many years of collecting it of like, how do we analyze it? What do we do with it? And we need data scientists to do that. I consider myself, what's the saying? Something master of none. Jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah, jack of all trades, master of none. So I, I know a lot of things about data, but I don't specialize in a particular style of data analysis, let's say. I think that's in many ways a strength, though, 
because that means you can pivot and you like have a lot of different tools to pull from. And then the ones that you do need to use, you can dive deeper into if you need more skills in that area. I often think of my skills as like a toolkit. So when I see a problem, I'm like, oh, this one needs a hammer or this one needs a screwdriver. Okay, now I think the part we've all been waiting for. What is an algorithm? Sure. So (laughs) (laughs) because to me, it's been this black box of you put information in, you get information out. I have trouble visualizing in my mind's eye what it actually is. (laughs) What it actually is? Okay. I pulled a definition of an algorithm from the Cambridge Dictionary for you. Thank you. (laughs) You're very welcome. So they say that an algorithm is a set of mathematical instructions or rules that, especially if given to a computer, will help to calculate an answer to a problem. I think this still is at my level of like black box. Okay. Info in, info out. (laughs) All right. So let's think about it. Let's say we're doing like a simple... Like you're fitting a line to data, like a linear regression. Mm -hmm. You want to see if it's positive or negatively correlated. That fitting process, when you fit a line, you're reducing what we call the residuals so that the distance from the points to the line is minimized. That process of reducing the residuals is an algorithm. Oh, okay. So it doesn't have to be as complex as the proprietary algorithms that a company like Spotify would have for their music recommendations. I feel like Spotify is using a a really large amount of algorithms. They're using some simple things, but they're also using some very advanced techniques as well. They're quite diverse. (laughs) If you're ever confused about what an algorithm is, I think an easy parallel would be like, think about it like a recipe. Your inputs would be the ingredients, the steps, and the recipe would be the steps that you're training your model to, and then the output or the result is the food. (laughs) (laughs) Interesting. I think that's a nice way of visualizing it because there are some steps in, let's say, baking a cake that you can see, but you can't really see. Like you can't see (laughs) the molecules changing under the heat of the oven. Mm, Unless you're Miss Frizzle and you can like go into the cake. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Miss Frizzle, (laughs) yes. (laughs) Okay, so how does Spotify bake their cakes? I guess I chose Spotify as a case study of music recommendation because they're one of the biggest ones, I believe. I don't have the exact statistics, but they also kind of focus on personalization. So I pulled this quote from their blog where they say personalization was an empowering experience for listeners who didn't have the time or knowledge to create endless unique playlists for every dinner party or road trip. And this was said by Spotify's VP of personalization in October of 2021. Hmm. So it's something that's really important to them. And they're using a number of things in order to personalize your experience in Spotify. But something that they talk about is silent data. Ooh, okay. What is silent data? What they describe as silent data is they say that Spotify and other music streaming services, they collect all kinds of data about their users. So their listening habits which songs they play the most, who they share them to, how often they share them, what time of day they listen to certain music. And like all of those things, the behind the scene things about your music usage and your music experience, that's all the silent data. Oh, I see. So it's not so much necessarily about what you're listening to. It's how do you listen? How do you interact with the music? So I should say that something that I very much appreciate about Spotify is all of their research or I, I, can't, I don't know if all of it, but a lot of it is published online. It's published in journals. They work with universities. So it's very easy to go in and find it and also to understand it because it's written at a reading level once they post it on their blog for like someone who doesn't have training in data science to understand. So in many cases, they're trying to understand the types of people who listen to certain types of music and what characteristics those individuals have. I have a small concern. Mm -hmm. What does it say about me (laughs) that I am in the top 2% of listeners of Taylor Swift? (laughs) I'm concerned about what they know about me. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like we should own our data. If you listen to T-Swift, like just own it. 
<laughs> oh, I own it. But I'm like, what, what do they know that I don't even know about myself? <laughs> so have you ever used their enhance function in the playlists? It's a relatively new function. Is that where it suggests songs to add to your playlist? Yeah. Yeah, I have actually. What types of songs do they suggest to you? Uh, usually Taylor Swift. <laughs> usually Taylor Swift. <laughs> so you have a strong preference for t- <laughs> <laughs> Or um, I also like uh, Vance Joy and like Noah Kahan. So they'll suggest okay. those. And then sometimes classic early 2000s like things that would be in mm. like a chick flick. I'm finding that when I use the enhance feature, I get a lot of soft rock, which is fair because I do listen to a lot of Billy Joel. I listen to a lot of Elton John. I like it. I like it. Okay. So they're using our preferences and what we listen to like infer or correlate personality traits. Yeah. About you and like predict given these things about you and what other people like you listen to, what other things are you likely to enjoy? So what what do they know? (laughs) I found this really fun paper that Spotify put out. And it's called Just the Way You Are, Linking Music Listening on Spotify and Personality. Oh, okay. I'm ready. This particular study, Just the Way You Are, they took 17.6 million songs and over 662,000 hours of music listened to by 5,808 Spotify users spanning a three-month period. And they investigated the link between personality traits and music listening behavior. And specifically, their findings from machine learning, which we'll talk about, show that the big five personality traits are predicted by music preferences and habitual listening behaviors with moderate to high accuracy. Oh, boy. (laughs) Are you familiar with the big five personality traits? The acronym's OCEAN, right? There's openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. In this article, they chose to call it emotional stability. That doesn't fit as well with the acronym, but uh, okay. (laughs) Yes. But yes, they took the silent data as well as the genres of music that these individuals were listening to. And they also had them complete the big five personality traits test to see which traits they fit into. And then they ran models to see if given the type of music that you listen to and your listening habits, can I predict whether or not you would fall under agreeableness or openness or extroversion? Okay. Can you tell us some of the top traits? Some of the top findings? Yeah. Before, can I talk a little bit about the modeling? Well, we are a data science podcast, so I think we should go for it. Okay. So in order to build a model, you have a whole bunch of data and you need to build But you also want to be able to test that model once you've built it to assess like how good it is. So what they do is they take all of the data and they divide it into two categories randomly, training and testing data. And in this case, they fit a lasso regression model to the training data. And lasso regression, it's a linear regression. And the lasso bit is a regularization method. And really what that does or The reason why we use methods like that is because we want to ensure that we don't overfit our data. Do you know what overfitting is, Lindsay? Not a clue. All right. I love it. I can give a definition. So overfitting means that you build the model so it predicts the data that you train it to very accurately, very precisely. But the minute you apply it outside of the training data, it fails because it's, it's fit too strongly to the training. So it has internal validity, but not external validity. Exactly. You run something like a lasso or a regularization method in order to make sure that you're not overfitting. They fit their regression, then they apply that model, and they calculate something called a Pearson correlation. And your Pearson correlation is on the scale from negative one to one. The closer you are to one, the stronger the correlation. And if you're positive, it's a positive correlation. For example, like as temperature goes up, more people buy sunscreen, that's a positive correlation. And then as the Pearson correlation becomes negative, that's the opposite. Or as temperature goes up, less people buy winter coats. That's a negative correlation. Now we get to like the fun figure because they calculated all of these correlations for 
certain genres of music and certain listening habits on the big five. Oh, I'm so excited. (laughs) I'm so excited. Okay, take us through a tour of what they found. So, for example, emotional stability correlated negatively with average skip rate, indicating that participants who are more neurotic tended to be more selective of what they listened to at any given moment. So they skipped more songs. I'm looking at the figure now. Openness was negatively correlated with country music. Yeah, that's interesting, right? But it's positively correlated with folk and classical. But negatively correlated with pop. Hmm. Another thing that they found was specific to extroversion. So those who scored higher on extroversion tended to listen more from others' playlists. Oh, that makes sense, though, because they're more social and it's almost like this digital interaction with other people. Yeah. I think it's also interesting that extroversion is negatively correlated with streaming from a desktop <laughs> because because think about it. If you're introverted, you can like stream from your desktop because you're probably at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas those extroverts are out and about, so they're streaming on their phones. <laughs> Overall. Their regression results show that emotional stability and conscientiousness are the most predictable for music listening behaviors compared to the other big five results. And there are a lot of things that might contribute to that because people who score on these personality traits might use music streaming in different ways. We don't have time to go through each correlation, but I find it very interesting. I guess perhaps we could do our own personality test, look at our big five, and then look at these graphs to see if we agree with the correlations. Maybe a follow-up episode. So I guess this brings us to the part of the episode where We're going to talk about what happens when algorithms aren't really sure who is going to like something. And to illustrate this point, I'm going to walk us through a case study similar to Spotify, but this time it's from Netflix. And it's this phenomenon that's been dubbed the Napoleon Dynamite effect. After the movie? (laughs) After the movie, yes. Netflix has this algorithm or recommendation software that they use to help their suggestions. And this is going back to when Netflix was, you know, somewhere that mails you DVDs. (laughs) The interesting thing about it is they have this software called Cinematch, and it analyzes how you view movies and recommends other things you might like. For example, like if you like this romantic comedy, you might like that one. Yeah, you might like its sequel. (laughs) But Netflix started to realize that there were a few places where they were hitting roadblocks. They had trouble improving the algorithm. They had movies that they couldn't recommend to people or like nobody wanted to watch? Sure. I think the problem was they needed to make the algorithm more sophisticated. There was stuff that it was missing or that they were recommending that people didn't actually want to watch and vice versa. Okay. That people might have wanted to watch that wasn't being recommended because that you know, factor or variable maybe wasn't being taken into account. Yeah, there's like a gap in their modeling, perhaps. Exactly. Around 2007, Netflix launched the Netflix Prize, which was a $1 million prize that they would give to anyone who could improve Cinematch's predictions to be 10% more accurate. Okay. $1 million is a ton of money. But for Netflix, this is a good business deal because that is cheaper than the money you would make if you improved the algorithm. So the competition started in October 2006, and by 2008, no one had fixed the problem yet. Hmm. So they had 30,000 hackers worldwide working on it. There was this Netflix prize webpage, and they instantly calculated the percent improvement And they even had like a leaderboard and everything. Kind of like a video game in a sense. Some people were software engineers or programmers or, you know, in that space already. And then some people were kind of hobbyists that were like, I'll take a crack at it for a million dollars. You know, Netflix had data sets and like listings and customer ratings on like a five-star scale that they distributed to help people teach their models. 
So people would be looking at patterns. They would be predicting customer behavior. And there's some really cute stories in this New York Times article about it, about like people whose kids were helping them thinking about like, okay, if someone likes the first two Matrix movies, are they going to think the third one is hot trash or are they going to love it? (laughs) And so it's kind of interesting. Parents were brainstorming with their kids and, you know, one even had one of their kids helping with the calculus and the algebra. There's some very cute stories about the people working on it. They started to realize, though, with the competitors that the progress was stalling before they hit that 10% improvement. And one of the things that stood in their way (laughs) was the movie Napoleon Dynamite. For anyone who's not familiar with the film, it's this indie comedy. It was released in 2004. And it's one of those movies that's like kind of hit this cult following versus cult hatred they started to realize that it was really challenging to determine kind of like what Spotify was doing. Who likes Napoleon Dynamite and why? And who doesn't? And so they were starting to have a problem that like that was accountable for about 15% of what they were trying to improve. Just one singular movie. There were a few others that were also challenging. (laughs) Basically, what ended up happening with Napoleon Dynamite is usually, like, the predictions are within eight-tenths of a star of what people will actually end up rating them. But with Napoleon Dynamite, they were off by an average of 1.2 stars for their recommendations. That's pretty far. Especially on, like, three stars versus one. So they were starting to have trouble with it. Like, half the people loved it, half the people hated it, and they didn't really know why. And basically, what ended up happening is people realized that if you could fix the Napoleon Dynamite problem, you would probably win the prize if you were far enough along. There were other movies, too, that, like, had huge error rates. Some of them were I Heart Huckabees, Boston Translation, Fahrenheit 9-11, The Life uh, Aquatic with Steve Zissou, Kill Bill Volume 1 only, not Volume 2. One of the really neat things to come out of this competition, though, was this sense of collaboration across the world. So people would share things that they were working on and things that had worked for them to improve their algorithm with other teams. And even though everyone had their own tweaks that they were making, a lot of them ended up working with pretty much the same modeling techniques. So one of them, which I'm sure you'll be more familiar with than me, is singular value decomposition. My understanding is it essentially breaks everything down into factors. So one of the examples they gave is that if you like Sleepless in Seattle, which is dubbed kind of a chick flick, and Tom Hanks is in the movie and you like Tom Hanks, you will probably like other Tom Hanks movies and other romantic comedies. I see. Once one person started using singular value decomposition, a lot of the other teams did, and people in the top 10 were like really collaborating a lot. Lavania, we've talked about how, you know, it started in 2006. By 2008, still going on. Yeah. How long do you think it took to actually hit the 10% if anyone did hit it? I'm going to say five years. It was actually three years later. Oh, okay. Yeah. So not bad considering you're trying to wrestle with Napoleon Dynamite. And I'm guessing also like as more and more people use Netflix, they have more and more data to use and to model with. In that time period, like 2006, 2008, I feel like Netflix was really taking off. Yes, absolutely. So the $1 million prize was awarded to Belcour's Pragmatic Chaos. It was a team of seven people. Two of them were actually researchers for AT&T. There was actually another team that had a 10% improvement, but the team that won submitted 24 minutes before the second team which I'm sure to this day haunts the other team. (laughs) 24 minutes is not a long period of time. So how did they solve the Napoleon Dynamite effect or problem? You know, I couldn't really find that information. I don't know if they just tweaked other things enough that they never actually ended up solving the Napoleon Dynamite problem. But one thing I was thinking is I don't think I've ever been recommended Napoleon (laughs) Dynamite on Netflix. Nor have I. (laughs) So that is the story of the Napoleon Dynamite effect and a three-year contest to improve Netflix's algorithm by 10%, which ended up in seven people winning a million dollars for their efforts. A real claim to fame to be able to say that you solved that. Yes, you improved the Netflix algorithm. 
So that brings us to science seed time, and it's our final science seed of season three. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Science Seeds, each episode we like to give our listeners something to think about, a science nugget to help you think more critically about the science, statistics, and numbers that you hear every day. So do you want to take us away, Lavanya? What I wanted to talk about today is that as we have discussed in like the Napoleon Dynamite problem, as well as when we talked about personality traits and Spotify's recommendation, these models that we're building they're only as good as the data that they train to and the people who are building the models. Like a common saying is that models are not inherently biased, but we train them to be. I've heard many different examples of this, and there's an excellent book, which we've mentioned on the podcast before, called Invisible Women, Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. And one of the examples in that, which I have recognized a lot, is with voice recognition software. A lot of those devices are trained on models for recognizing voice, where there's a higher percentage of male speakers that are used as the audio clips to train them. And women tend to have higher voices, not all obviously that's just a generalization but I myself have a higher voice and I find myself whether consciously or subconsciously is the first time I try to say hey Siri it doesn't pick up and so I lower my voice and I say hey Siri and then it works (laughs) that's that's just one example there's also face ID was having trouble differentiating between people of Asian descent An iPhone is not inherently biased, but the people who make the algorithm that's on the phone can be. And I think something also to think about is when we're building these models and we're using the data, I think it's important to think about how we're using the data and what the models are doing. If we're building models that will keep you attached to your Instagram account, for example, and keep you scrolling, is that really good for an individual? Right. And that's that's the alignment problem, right? That like what we're building with artificial intelligence or algorithms in these models is not necessarily to meet personal goals and healthy habits of the people consuming them. A lot of the time, the goals of those algorithms or those models is to increase revenue. Yes. And you are, in a sense, the commodity for these apps that aren't charging money, right? Like if you aren't paying for it, you are the product. They're collecting your data. And we all have choices and trade-offs that we choose to make. Your trade-off of convenience and privacy is something that we all kind of weigh consciously or subconsciously with each decision we make. I think it's important to think about that, how these models that are built to recommend services to you, like music or movies, or like give you ads, what part of your life are they playing? And like, where do you see them? Because I think it's important to understand the effect and the purpose that they are built with. Thanks for listening, everyone. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. You can find the references we use for this episode in our show notes. A special thank you to Julian Bertino, who does our sound editing and music. If you have a moment, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It really helps our podcast reach new listeners. Have an idea of what number we should cover next? Want to learn more about what we talked about today? Follow us on Instagram at The Secret Life of Numbers. We'll catch you next time on The Secret Life of Numbers, where the numbers can run, but they can't hide. Thank <laughs> you.